Helen Bond, please, this morning. Thanks. Thanks, Troy. Considering the fact that unlike most Jews for Jesus missionaries, I myself am a nice Gentile boy from Shawnee, Oklahoma, <laughs> but I married the boss's daughter who's sitting here on the front row with me in 1974, I think the uh, best way to greet you is to say shalom, y'all. <laughs> this morning we're going to be considering the... Old Testament scriptures, not all of them, that lead to the discovery of who Jesus really is and what his mission is and how we see him strongly in the Old Testament, but we're going to start in the New Testament. I'm going to reference the last chapter of Luke. The last chapter of Luke is chapter 24, right before the Gospel of John, and Jesus has already risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm getting ahead. That's the Easter, isn't it? <laughs> Resurrection Sunday. And he's already appeared to his disciples along the road to Emmaus. But in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, is where I find my introduction to this. Because I'll tell you something. While you're looking there, Luke 24, 44, if we had a field trip this morning and we got in, well, I don't know if there's a bus or vans. We piled in to as many cars and, and went to the rabbi's study. Where's there a synagogue? Do we have to go to Eugene or Corvallis or somewhere? And we're going to go in there. We probably don't have to break in, you know, because we're, we don't want to get arrested, but maybe there's uh, people preparing for their bar mitzvah and maybe it's, uh, it's open. What does the rabbi's Bible look like? If we took a peek into his study, we might find that the books of the Bible that we have in common are only 39. They have the 39 books of the Old Testament. He has something as long as the Encyclopedia Britannica that's called the Mishnah and the Gomorrah, you know, the, and the Talmud, and that's just commentary on the law. That's not scripture. But he might have a Bible that has all the books that we have between Genesis and Malachi in three volumes instead of in one. And they would be called the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The law, the prophets, and the writings. And as we look at our text, uh, Jesus uh, appearing in an upper room. He didn't even use the door. The disciples are gathered uh, there. And he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ, or Mashiach, should suffer and rise again on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Those three divisions uh, Jesus was aware of as well, the law, the prophets, and the writings. If you want to see Jesus in the Torah, in the law, in the first five books of Moses, you just go find a... Jews for Jesus Christ in the Passover demonstration somewhere. Or you come to the Exodus class, you know, of the, uh, the churches having here. Or you uh, find, you know, a book that talks about the feasts of Israel, the gospel in the feasts of Israel. But we're going to look at the prophets and the writings this morning. Two places where we will see a suffering servant and a reigning king. Two different motifs. Let's look at the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a scary book for some of our Jewish friends, the people uh, <clears throat> to whom Lynn and I minister. She has a caseload of women. I'm working on a caseload of men. And we, uh, we find people that, that are like this. Uh, my friend Jay from L.A., he walked into a rabbi's a study in North Hollywood. And he said, Rabbi, I'm Jewish. And I have a question about Isaiah. The rabbi said, you're a Christian, aren't you? He said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm Jewish and I'm a Christian. How did you know? Because you have a question about Isaiah. Jewish people don't want to know about Isaiah. Only Christians is what he was told. <laughs> this is maybe not universal, but it's anecdotal. It's what happened, you know, in our case. Isaiah has a lot of oracles, a lot of oracles against the nations. There's a lot of judgment in there. It goes for a lot of chapters. 
it doesn't get very bright until you get to chapter 40, you know, where there are bright promises for Israel. Israel is being taken to the woodshed. She is a child of God, and she's been punished, you know, and then not disowned, not annihilated. There's a bright future for her. So look at chapter 42 of Isaiah. In chapter 42 of Isaiah, we have the beginning of servant songs, and they go all the way through chapter 53, where we're going next. Isaiah 42 through 53, those chapters, are a collection of poems that talk about the servant of the Lord. And when you're in the middle of the servant songs, you get the idea that maybe the servant is Israel, because it says that at the beginning of the uh, 44th chapter, I believe. But by the time you get to 53, you see it's very crystal clear. It can only be a representative, individual, person who is the servant of the Lord, who also belongs to the tribes of Israel and will do what we call vicarious atonement. Someone pays the price for sin and someone else goes free. Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. That's a pretty big task. Well, check this out. This is not how you go about doing this. Just talk to our political can candidates. Verse 2, He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. How is he going to pull this off? A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. So he is one who will rule and reign, but you know what? This, this is poetry. And what the poet here, Isaiah, is saying, and by the way, if you want to know how many Isaiahs wrote the book of Isaiah, just check with Jesus. He knows who wrote Isaiah. He says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy. You know? But anyway, uh, this, this poem is basically using imagery of a dimly smoldering wick. Now, if you are having trouble with candles you know, in, in your home or in a church and somebody goes running through, <laughs> chances are it's going to snuff out. It doesn't take much. It's, ba it's a really precarious balance. It's uh, really easy to snuff it out. Or uh, if you see a reed that is bent already, but it hasn't broken into two pieces, it doesn't take much of a wind to break that all the way. The poet is basically not saying, oh, this servant of the Lord is a nice guy. He won't kick you if you're down, so be sure and be humble. He's saying it's possible to miss the appearance of the servant of the Lord because at his first appearance, he won't make a big splash. It's possible for you to say business as usual, to say what um, a lady said in Rogers Park. That's a neighborhood in Chicago where Lynn and I ministered for 16 years, also with Jews for Jesus. I was going to go fix my friend's toilet because he was Jewish and not very mechanical, always having grown up in cities and things. I'm not saying all Jews are like this, but he certainly was my friend Richard, and then <clears throat> I'm getting my gear out, going to go up to his condo, but the van says, Jews for Jesus. And the woman says, you know, the wolf doesn't lie down with the lamb. I said, excuse me? The wolf doesn't recline with the lamb. There, there's no peace. You know, the, the children don't, don't play by the, the den of the snake. So I guess your boy Jesus is not the one we're looking for because, you know, the headlines say he's going to bring peace, right? And our headlines don't say that. Well, we got into a brief conversation before I went up to Richard. But it's possible to miss him at the first coming because he comes as a suffering servant, as a man of sorrows. Let's move over to Isaiah 53, the end of our collection of servant songs. And this is not unfamiliar to you. I know a lot of you know it. Uh, it really starts kind of in 52 13, behold, my servant will prosper. He'll be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And people would be astonished. Kings will, you know, shut their mouths, etc. And then verse 2, Isaiah 53, 2, part of the same psalm. Why is there a chapter division here? We're told in seminaries that 
monks were riding along, riding these things, and every time a donkey hit a bump, that would be a new chapter. So now you know, okay? <clears throat> Of course, in the Hebrew scriptures, there are scrolls, and there are not these same chapter divisions, but eventually, eventually, nowadays, in our modern printed uh, Jewish Bibles, they also have very similar chapter divisions within one verse of ours, one way or the other, in the numbering. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself has borne and our sorrows he has carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his stripes or scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want to show you something in, these, uh, in verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. A lot of people are fond of saying lately in this day and age that this describes Israel. Israel is the suffering servant. Kind of like what happened to Joseph. He was righteous, but yet he suffered, you know, by being thrown in a pit and then he was, you know, uh, thrown in jail because of a misunderstanding with Potiphar's wife. And then, you know, f eventually what men had intended for evil was used for good. But this can't be Israel because Israel can't take Israel's place. Israel can't be cut off out from the land of the living for the sake of Israel uh, because Israel is Israel. So this is vicarious atonement. This is like a lamb who was shed and his blood collected uh, and at twilight placed on the two doorposts and on the lintel the Passover lamb. Uh, the Lord looks and when he sees the blood, he passes over us because uh, the standard uh, of righteousness has been fulfilled by someone else. And so that's what's going on here in chapter 53. I am fond of asking Jewish people, do you have a category for a Messiah that gets cut off? Certainly our lady that said, hey, the wolf doesn't recline with the lamb. Hey, there's no peace. She doesn't have that uh, category. But also in the book of Daniel, in chapter 9, it will be 62 weeks of year until Messiah the Prince is cut off and he'll have nothing, and yet it continues that he'll prosper and reign afterwards. So here's someone that gets cut off and yet does, and as it says in Isaiah 53 later on, see his offspring. He does triumph, ultimately. And so this points to Jesus, you know, coming and dying on the cross and paying the price for us and seeming to have lost as his disciples are scattered. You know, before the, the Holy Spirit came, as they were waiting in the upper room, the uh, disciples were having a bad hair day, weren't they? Everything was going wrong for them. They were scattered. They were afraid. Peter wouldn't even admit that he was knew Jesus, you know. Uh, but boy, after the Holy Spirit, these guys are winners in areas where they used to be losers. Mighty miracles are happening. They're testifying to all of Israel. They're getting thrown in jail and getting out with no trouble. And the people are really astonished that they don't run and hide after they get out. They just go back to the same place. I'd say the Holy Spirit's making winners out of losers. Let's go backtrack to the book of Psalms to look for the reigning king. We have a first things first, a suffering servant, followed by a reigning king. Psalm number two, Psalm chapter two, if you will. It's only got 12 verses. This talks about what our lady in Rogers Park was looking for, okay? The reign of the Lord's anointed. Anointed. I wonder how you say that in Hebrew, anointed. 
I think it's Mashiach. I wonder how you say Mashiach in Greek. I think it's Christos, okay? So we know who we're talking about here. Why are the nations in an uproar? The peoples devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. Their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Moshiach, his anointed. And why would the nations be coming up against the, the Lord? I think they don't like, it's a real estate turf battle, okay? They don't want him to set his king on earth and to rule over them. Let us, this is the quote of the kings, okay? This is not the psalmist. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. Have you ever had the uh, occasion of someone smaller than you and weaker than you and cuter than you? I know that's hard to imagine. But someone cuter than you like a kid or a pet try to keep you from leaving the house? No, you can't go to work, Daddy, or no, Mommy, you can't go to the store. You have to stay here and play with me. It's kind of funny because they're so small and so powerless that they're going to put their hand on their hip and keep you from going and block the door, you know. But uh, what if it goes on for about 12 or 15 minutes, you know? I don't know if it's funny after that long, is it? They might get what um, my wife's people call a pachim tukas, but uh, I'm not going to translate that. Anyway, that's what happens here when the Lord finally speaks to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury because his righteousness demands this. Can't let evil steamroll people forever. You have to corral it. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan said that, um, that hell is the safeguard of heaven and that it, uh, it keeps the meek of the earth from continuing uh, to be persecuted and, and flattened and give me a God who will deal with evil and I am most secure in the universe. Verse 6, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. This is the Lord executing the counsel of his will and no <clears throat> army can stop it. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance. Now, I don't know how many nations King David had. He just ruled over Israel. There was Judah and Israel. There were, was a divided uh, kingdom, and David was able to rule over both of those. He didn't go out and conquer Italy, and he didn't go off to China, you know, or India or Ethiopia. And the very ends of the earth as thy possession. So this speaks of a future son of David related to David beyond the scope of David's own lifetime 1,000 years before Jesus. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. Those are the ones that continue to ultimately oppose God. Now check this out. God's going to do what he's going to do, and you can't stand in his way. And if you ultimately say no, you will not have your kingdom on this earth that you created because I'm the creature and I'm not going to let you, then ultimately you are in harm's way. And yet, in grace, the Lord warns the kings of the earth in the psalm, in the song. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning. Oh, judges of the earth, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, he didn't just fly around in the heavens like a stealth God waiting for us to do something wrong so that he could zap us. He jars us and wakes us up and gives us disturbing bad news before it's too late. He gives us a chance to turn around, to do a 180, to repent. Verse 11, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. That's the kind of worship I think uh, our worship team would agree with me that, that the Lord inspires. It is awesome. It is fearful. It's not light and trite like we had in the Jesus Revolution where, when I came to faith. <laughs> but verse 
12. What does your Bible say? Does it say do, do homage to the Son? Does it say kiss the Son? Or does it say worship the Son? Those are good translations, all of them. Lest He become angry and you perish in the way. Wait a minute. This is the Son. Worship the Son. You're not supposed to worship a human being. Every Jew knows this. Unless He's deity. So this is the Son of God who is God Himself in the flesh, for his wrath may be soon kindled. And we could just end the psalm on that bad negative note. Some of them do. But we have a, a, a great one. How blessed, uh, Asher, are all who take refuge in him. He's waking us up. He's warning us not to keep kicking against the goads as he told Saul, you know, Saul, why do you persecute me? It hurts you to kick against the goad. That was the voice of Jesus in the book of Acts. and Knocked him off his horse. That's not exactly a cushy way to come to faith, is it? I don't think all of us had a cushy way of coming to faith either, did we? That's the way the Lord does. He's in the business of striking, but healing. He's in the business of jarring people and waking them up and blessing them and bringing them into the fold. Um, I want, us, uh, I want to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a minute. Lord, we thank you that in a couple of weeks as we approach a celebration of the resurrection, that uh, you uh, remind us that uh, you remind us, Lord, that um, as, we, as we eat the feast uh, of um, communion, we look back to a sacrifice that you've made and we look forward to your coming. As often as you eat the feast, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. We look back and see a sacrifice and a suffering servant and one with amazing humility who humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. And we look forward to a reigning king who will solve the issues and who will be welcomed by the meek of the earth and those who long for your coming, Lord. And here we are in the middle. Well, not really the middle, pushing up against the, your return, Lord, but in between. And we ask for you to give us the gift of wisdom that we might exercise it in the present. Help us not to live just in the past, but to look back to your sacrifice. Not to live just in the future, like quitting our jobs and waiting on the rooftop like the Thessalonians for you to come back. But Lord, look working while it is still day. You are the light of the world, and as long as you were in the light of the world, you said that um, you must do the work of the one who sent you, and then you pass the baton to us. So before your appearance, Holy Spirit, make us winners. Holy Spirit, use us to share with our neighbors, even, in the, even at the gas station, in the grocery store, Lord, not just at, at church events. We pray in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. I'm going to invite Lynn to come up for a minute, and I think we need that portable mic if it's around anywhere. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> it's over here on the piano. Thank you much, sir. And tell about our ministry. Thanks, Alan. Mm -hmm. So, click. There's two buttons. Now is it on? Yeah. Yes. Great. It's wonderful to be here. Alan and I have been serving with Jews for Jesus since 1975, and um, this is one of the things we really enjoy doing, the time of year when we get to come and visit a different church every day for two weeks and tell about the ministry and meet some people who we hope will be our friends. So we hope when you came in you received a card like this. This is a Jews for Jesus tradition, which some of you may have already done, Jews for Jesus has a long history with First Baptist Church. So some of you may have already done this, but let's do it again just because it's tradition. Take the card out. We're going to fold it. When I count to three, we'll rip it together. But don't rip it first. We want to see what kind of sound we can make as we rip it together. At the count of three. All right? Are you ready? Echad, Stein, Shalosh. Arba. Hey, Alan, I don't think their Hebrew is too good. Okay, so I said three, and then I said four, and if you haven't ripped it yet, please go ahead and rip it now. And unless you're extremely talented, you should have two pieces of card, 
One is larger and one is smaller and has my husband's lovely face on it. It's a good thing I married him because I'm not much to look at, but he sure is. Anyway, what we would like you to do is go ahead and fill that out now. Why do I want you to fill it out? Well, Alan mentioned that he married the boss's daughter. My father went to be with the Lord in 2010. But my sister and I continue to carry on and Alan carry on his legacy. And my younger sister, Ruth, is the editor of our Jews for Jesus newsletter. It looks like this. Does anybody get this at home already? Great. I hope that you're reading it. I have to tell you, when it comes to our home, the first thing I do is rip it open, read the cartoon, and then look for my sister's mistakes. Yeah, I'm the bossy big sister. But I don't usually find mistakes. What I do find is there's always something in there that helps me. It boosts my faith, and it helps me to know how to be praying for my Jews for Jesus co-workers around the world. Jews for Jesus exists to make the Messiahship of Jesus an unavoidable issue to our Jewish people worldwide. And so we want you to fill out this card so that you can be receiving our free monthly newsletter and so that you can be blessed, but also so that you can be praying for our ministry. You know, missionaries operate on prayers the way that cars operate on gas. And we think that the newsletter will help you to know better how to be praying for us more specifically. Now, um, I have a bribe for you. Are you ready? I don't know if we're supposed to bribe people in church or not, but this is what I was instructed to tell you. If you'll fill out this card, we would like to send you a little booklet that tells about the festival's um, the appointed times from the Hebrew scripture and how Jesus fulfills those. So we'd like to get that to you in addition to the regular newsletter. Now, maybe you're not a reader. I don't care. I think that when that envelope shows up in your mailbox, you'll at least remember me standing here asking for your prayer. And if you don't read it, maybe you'll turn it in somewhere to be recycled or you'll give it to another friend who might get more out of it because they like to read. But anyway, we want you to receive our newsletter. We want you to be praying for us. And that brings me to the second part about my little talk. Well, I told you that we don't usually stand in front of churches. That's about two weeks out of the year when we get to do that. What are we doing the rest of the time? Well, we hand out gospel tracts, Alan, and we have a huge branch in San Francisco. When Alan and I left San Francisco in 1986, there were half the people there that were Jewish, half the Jewish population there then, but they were twice as interested. We've returned some years later, came back to the Bay Area in 2014, and now there are twice as many Jewish people there, and they seem half as interested. So we need you to pray that they'll be more interested, that the Lord would speak to their hearts, that there would be truly a spiritual revival as there was in the early 70s. Anyway, I did bring some of our free gospel tracts. This one says, are you a Facebook addict? And then you have to read through it to find out how that has, ends up talking about Jesus. Then this is another one that we like to hand out downtown. Shop till you drop. So pick these up. They're free. They're on the table out in, um, just outside of the sanctuary here. And then there's some not-so-free stuff, which we hope you'll be interested in, too. But if you take the not-so-free stuff, please check with me before you take it. So how can you be praying for us? Pray for the city where we are working. 400,000 Jewish people, maybe less than 1% of them know Jesus. Alan and I and our other co-worker, Rob, are not going to meet all 400,000 of those Jewish people. So pray that when the, we're meeting with people, we're meeting with people who have been prepared by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, to hear and to understand that salvation is at hand and his name is Yeshua, Jesus. So I'm going to say a word of prayer for our work and for your pastor and the missions team. And then at that time, I'm going to ask that the ushers would come forward and receive the offering. Please put this signed portion into the basket or the plate or whatever you're passing. If you don't have time, to fill it out, I'll be at the table back there, and I'll be happy to take it with you, with me then. I hope we get to take these home with us. I hope you will take this home with you with this wonderful picture of my handsome husband. 41 years almost we're married. So I'm going to pray now. Lord Jesus, we pray for the people from this church that have gone to Mexico to lead Vacation Bible School. I pray that they'll find open hearts and that they will be able to speak your words of salvation, that eternity would be changed for many people and young people there. 
And Lord, thank you for this church for allowing us to come and share our burden, to share the faith, to share Jesus with Jewish people. Father, I pray that as you send us out from here, we will find those people whose hearts have been prepared for, to hear the gospel. Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity, and thank you for helping us to see you and to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.